live, guys. Good, and we are live, guys. Good evening from Singapore. Day seven of quarantine, episode eight of Get the Facts Fallen. As I virtually take you around the world today, this evening, got a very exciting interview. I'm gonna introduce you to one of my friends who I recently met within the last month, and um, she is from Vietnam, but she's currently living in Tokyo. Uh, so excited to have her join. Let's see. Okay, she is in. Let me add her to the live chat Instagram. Let's see if this works. Connecting. Yes, look at this. We fixed the problem. How you doing? Perfect. So introduce yourself, your name, where you're from. Hi, my name is Ha. I'm from Hanoi, the capital city of Vietnam, and I'm living in Tokyo, Japan. You are in a crazy city right now. I'm quite jealous. I wish the Olympics weren't canceled. Well, excuse me, not canceled, postponed. Very disappointing. But let's get into that in a second. Do you want to tell the story on how we met, or do you want me to jump in? Oh, uh, yeah. How we met? We met at a casino. <laughs> yes, we fun. did. <laughs> so, yo, who do you want to well, best travel hack ever, guys. So if you're ever in Singapore, if you go to the Marina Bay Sands, you can go and join their uh, basically loyalty program. And if you're a foreigner, sometimes they give you a free pass to join the Platinum Club for three months. And if you get into the Platinum Club, you get to go to the Ruby Room, which is one of the only free places you get free alcohol in Singapore. Alcohol is very expensive here, so getting free beer, free alcohol is amazing. So MBS, thank you. And it made our friendship so much better. I mean, what a what a way to start. So, yeah, we, I, yeah it was fantastic. So, how's it going? You had you just finished up your Asian travels, right? You're traveling around yeah. for a bit now. Back yeah. into how was that? Where'd you, where'd you end up going? So I went to Singapore, Thailand, Laos, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. So five countries over four weeks, and I just came back to Japan on the 18th of March, ten days ago. So was. Any, any issues getting back into Japan? Not at all. Like, it was really easy. Like, they didn't even mind that I've been to Southeast Asian countries before that. They didn't even ask. And then, like, when I was at the airport at the immigration, they didn't even, like, give any suggestions that I should go under self-quarantine. Just nothing. Just stand on a passport and pass. Didn't say anything. No, no. Wait, interesting. Wow, that's probably the most relaxed airport in the world right now. I mean, even... I couldn't believe it. Nepal. Nepal, with which had one case. They checked our temperature before we boarded, checked our temperature after, and then sprayed us with this sanitary, like, uh, basically hand wash, I think, to make sure we didn't have any germs with us, and then checked our temperature again. Nepal, Japan, you literally got your passport stamped. Yeah. That blows after. my mind. No temperature check, no sanitizer. I, I was just thinking that they were being a bit too lax, a bit too chill about this, considering how Tokyo is really densely populated. And yeah, talking about Tokyo, they are not like imposing any like lockdown policies yet. The governor of Tokyo only like strongly recommends staying at home and working from home if possible and not going to shopping malls, but it's all on a voluntary basis. So like restaurants are still operating, like subways are still running. Everything is happening at the, like, at the usual pace. Every, so everything is open. There is nothing, everything. nothing's closed. Everything is open. Like they just operate at like reduced hours. Like the stores might close earlier than usual, but you can still see a lot of people walking on the streets. There are like somewhat fewer people. Some people are wearing masks, but you can still see a lot of like say parents with children, and they don't even like let the children wear the mask. So that is fascinating. Yeah, so it's like a facade of safe, of safety, like a false facade of safety. But but right. there is a spike in cases recently, so it's actually not as safe as it looks. You're right, right, right. Wow, that, that approach is really interesting. And, but that makes sense why they took so long to announce they want to postpone the Olympics. I mean, they really took their time. I mean, the, out of all the major sporting events around the world, they were the last to announce. And I get how difficult it is to, to reschedule the Olympics. But what's has there been a, a vibe going through public or some of your friends there that after the announcement of the Olympics, what's the, what's the general consensus? Are people glad they postponed it? Are people upset? What are you hearing? Well, like the public was, of course, upset. The Japanese population was, they, they were sad over that because it was supposed to be like um, a push in the, in leveraging the Japanese economy and the Japanese brand image in the world. 
but even right. before the official decision was made about the postponement then like um on a public survey of uh, of a huge Japanese newspaper called Kyodo then 70% of the population already predicted that it will be canceled or postponed anyways what? so it anticipate that considering Interesting. yeah yeah well, I, I, well, I mean, luckily it gives them another year of marketing for it, right? So, I mean, I, yes, it sucks that it's not this year, but I mean, everyone, everyone's going to know about this Olympics now, right? They're still having it. They're just postponing it by a year. So that's at least exciting for, you know, the citizens there that they know it's still coming. It's not canceled, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I mean, as an Olympic fan, am I disappointed it's going to be 2020? Absolutely. But for the world, I think it's best that they did postpone it. And it's uh, the my selfies can wait. I'll still be ready. You know, it's another year of prep. My selfies is fun, and um, now I'm excited to eventually get to Japan. Uh, so, so yeah. Any man, that's really interesting. Anything else going on with COVID? I mean, are people keeping up with the the virus around the world? Or are they just going on with life? Is so? You, I asked earlier. Your school isn't canceled. You're still going to school. Well, no, uh, the semester in Japan like operates on a different time frame. So the spring semester is from mid-April until the end of July. So my school semester was supposed to start on April the 13th, but now it was pushed right two weeks, so it's now going to be the 27th. But naturally, okay. even in normal years, and we are still not having classes right now. So we still haven't seen that many changes in the start of the semester yet, but the commencement ceremonies of almost all universities were canceled in March. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they do acknowledge it by pushing back school, but everything yeah. else is still open. Interesting strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully it doesn't bite them in the butt and catch up with them later down the road. Oh, man. how uh, I will be so frustrated is if they don't close things down now and it ends up exploding in six months and then they have to postpone the Olympics again. That would be, like, worst yeah. case scenario. Oh so, yeah, was- Japan, please get a hold of it. Like, let's get on top of this issue rather than playing catch up like my country, the United States which we are officially number one in the world. We have the most cases, which I'm not proud of, but we are a competitive country and uh, we're number one again, which is uh, not yeah. good number one to be. It's not the Olympics that anyone wants to be a part of. No, nah, no. Nah. All right, so enough about COVID-19. We're gonna, guys, who's watching this, we're gonna mix it up on you because Ha is actually from Vietnam, like she said. So rather than focusing on travel in Japan, we're gonna focus on Vietnam. So. Top three, must three things you need to see when you go to Vietnam. Let's hear it. First of all, Halong Bay. Halong Bay is a UNESCO heritage bay with like limestone caves and really beautiful like islets, islands. So highly recommend it. Yes. Do a night cruise around that at least like two, three nights. So you would go further off the shore, not just like the lousy beaches, but actually like um, in the bay. Second would be, yeah. I would say, Oh, anyway, I'm from obviously because you can see a mix of French and Vietnamese architecture. So, um, the third would where, be where is that? Sorry, where is that? What city? The second, Hanoi. Oh, oh, hold on. Oh, ah, okay. Sorry, Mr. G. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good city. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. have a city, right? And then the third one would be if you can ride a motorbike, then I would recommend doing the Hazang Loop. Hazang is on the mountainous area of northern Vietnam, so it has a lot of like ethnic minorities living there. So you can like go to the like staircase, rice paddy fields um, on the mountains, and you can do the loop on your scooter. So it was like an adventure. It would be really exciting. I think Vietnam is best known for being the country to go motorbike in. There's a lot of yeah. people that ride from Ho Chi Minh to Hanoi or Hanoi down to Ho Chi Minh. And it usually, t- like, minimum, what I've heard is usually what, like three weeks, maybe two and a half, three weeks to, yeah. to really enjoy it so you're not riding super long days. But I, one of these days when I get back to Vietnam, I would love to do that. Didn't have enough time my first time there, but uh, it, it, I've had buddies who have done it. It looks amazing. And second, what you said, the, uh, or the first statement, Halong Bay, that's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Um, um, yeah. Actually, the, the first place I lost a drone, I had a uh, rookie mistake flying my drone there. But Kappa Island is so great, and I mean, ah. that's a good home base. I did the three-day, two-night cruise, and, um, oh, I loved it. That that. That is a spot I need to get back to because I, I do miss it. It's absolutely stunning. So yeah, all right. Let's dive into food. What food. what food? If yeah, what's your favorite type of food from Vietnam? Street food. Um. So 
if you guys are familiar with Vietnamese cuisine that we pho, pho is rice noodles with chicken or beef with really savory and tasty broth made from pork bones. So that's like the staple, like the signature food of Vietnam. Cannot miss it. Like yes. And second one would be spring rolls. Spring rolls like in rice wraps. Inside you have pork, vermicelli, um, cilantro, and other herbs. R really tasty. Third one will be bánh mì. Bánh mì is like French baguette, but like shorter like this, like, like a subway. And then yep. you can have a lot of different fillings, like meat, pate, omelet, other herbs, cilantro, again, whichever you want to put in that. So, uh, so bottom line is pho, spring rolls, and bánh mì. Is that your order of your favorite? Those three. Uh, if you had to pick one of those dishes to eat the rest of your life, what do you pick? Bánh mì. <laughs> it's cheap. What? <laughs> bánh mì. Yeah, okay. Okay. It's, All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's diverse in the feelings, ingredients inside. No, definitely. And I think something that's so great is not only the food is so, so, so good in Vietnam, but it's so cheap as well. Yeah. I, Vietnam, hands down, has the best street food on the planet. Yeah. Bangkok and Thailand, they're known for their street food. I know the government was going to shut those down, so still, you know, not the scene that it used to be. But if you want the best street food in Southeast Asia or the world in general, you have to go to Vietnam. It's so, I mean, for one US dollar, you're gonna a massive plate of food, uh, you'll get a soup and a drink. You can't beat that. That's the cheapest food, but it's so good. It's so, so good. Yeah. So, yeah. Are there any weird dishes, anything unique that like would be very odd for Westerners to eat? Weird dishes, I would say do dog meat, dog. You said dog meat? Yeah, they actually eat dogs, but it's not like puppies. It's not like the, <laughs> like the pet dog. <laughs> Pokemon. Like these dogs are like village dogs that like you just like let them roam like freely around like your farmhouse. So they actually have meat that can be eaten. Mm. How do exactly. they how do they serve the dog meat? Oh, uh, they, they would just grill the dog the dog meat and they serve with some like say like lime leaves and other herbs. Yeah. Do they okay. So paint a picture here for me. I'm imagining, you know how they put like a, they spit roast pigs, right? Uh, they just put pigs over, do they do that with dog meat? Does they do that with dogs? Do they do that with the whole dog? I don't remember <laughs> exactly, they might, they might. I didn't realize Vietnam, is this the whole country or is this like a certain region of Vietnam that does this? Uh, they would often eat that in the countryside. You the countryside, see, okay. Yeah, you can see some residents here and there in Hanoi, but it's not that common. Okay. Okay. One thing that I do remember from my time in Hanoi was the um, egg coffee. Egg, so ah. they make, right? Very famous for that region. I'm not a huge coffee drinker, but that was one cup of coffee that I, that I really did enjoy. Um, and it's just, it's, just, it's just Hanoi. They don't have it down south in Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, 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 yeah. They only have right? it in Hanoi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so All right. Look. Egg and, like make egg foam on top of the bitter coffee. So it was yeah, really nice. Yeah. No, it's very good. It's sweet. Yeah, it's very, it was good. And it, it, it's chilled. I don't, it wasn't hot, right? Really? No, it can be served at the hot or chill. I don't, it was, I, I don't remember. I, yeah, I just remember it was egg, the, the egg was really nice. I was surprised at how good it tasted. So we went to, there's like this, um, there was a rooftop cafe that overlooked the famous park. In, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's the spot to go to get it. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. How about stereotypes for Vietnam? Stereotypes. Any stereotypes that are true, that are false, that you can think of? Uh, uh, stereotypes. Well, like Vietnamese people can ride like motorbikes, like AKA scooters from a young age, even before the legal age of 18. Okay, this is true. <laughs> well, like at 15 or 16, you can ride like the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually get a license at 16, but only for the smaller ones. So this is kind of true, especially in a countryside Mm, yeah, the kids like 13, 14 years old, you can also find them on the road. It's not very safe, wouldn't recommend that, but it's quite Literally nice. kids driving, yes. But guys, and, like, so and sometimes families, right? We took buses yeah. through Vietnam, and it, it's yeah. almost a game to see how many people the Vietnamese mm -hmm. families can fit on a scooter. I mean, I think the most we saw was like six or seven. It was impressive. That's a lot. On average, it's like two. Like, oh no there were some on the countryside where i i could not believe they had that many people and like the mom had one kid in each arm and the dad had a couple and there was one in his <laughs> yeah. feet on the front like it, it was impressive i mean quite scary for the family but 
that's what they used to do, so it was fine. The, along with the motorbikes, I don't remember. I think it was Ho Chi Minh that was crazier than Hanoi. Sidewalks are considered part of the road. Uh, yeah. So in Ho Chi Minh, if you're walking on the sidewalk, you're avoiding motorbikes just as much as you're avoiding people, which okay. was a little bit dangerous, in my opinion. You just, you really kind of, as long as you stay your path, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But like, you got to know there's motorbikes coming on there, which I don't know, it added to the excitement for me. It made it even yeah. more of an adventure just walking down the street. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Dang. Anything else, anything else that come to mind? Any false stereotypes that you can think of about Vietnam? Well, it's true. Like, the the pavements are actually not really for the pedestrians because yeah. the city is growing really fast, but the urban infrastructure is not really catching up. So, like, the roads are still as narrow, but now you have cars and motorbikes. And then, like, bicycles, they all jammed up in the same road. So, and people still use scooters to move around a lot. So, in front of the stores and restaurants, they would just park their motorbikes on the pavements because, like, where else are you going to put the motorbikes? So, right. as a person, like, sometimes you have, like, no space on the pavement and you have to walk, like, on the curbs, like, very close to the, the, to the roads. Very yeah, yeah. not safe. Uh, I wouldn't like that. But well, I, I tell you what, so I'm, I'm glad I started my travels in Mumbai. Because a lot of people say that the traffic in Ho Chi Minh is the worst they've ever seen in their life. Luckily, Mumbai was worse. So I felt like a professional when I got to Ho Chi Minh teaching people how to cross the road. But if you really <laughs> want to step out of your comfort zone, I think a good Olympic sport would be crossing the street in Vietnam. I mean, it's especially Ho Chi Minh. It can be quite crazy. And just as soon as you start, you go. You don't hesitate. It's just, it's so interesting. The bikes are almost like water. I mean, it flows perfectly <laughs> around you as you walk. So... It's super scary. Just don't even look to your right or your left when you're crossing. You know, look before you go. Make sure you don't step right in front of a bike. But when you go, go and don't stop. <laughs> That's the safest thing to do when you get to Vietnam. Oh, man. So what, what's your favorite thing about your country? What do you love most about Vietnam? Favorite thing. People are really warm-hearted. you are really um, fond of travelers and visitors. We are really welcoming overall. So I think it's not just a Vietnamese thing. It's a Southeast Asian thing. So Definitely. it's people who will go out of their way to help you, even if they don't speak fluent English. But they will try to get someone to help you. Of course, you you should still be aware of like local minor scams and pickpockets. But yeah. otherwise, you'll do fine. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. I mean, going back to biking through the country, some of my buddy, I have a couple of buddies from Canada who did it, and they, one of them at one point, the one of their bikes broke down, which is it frequently happens, right? Because these bikes are run up and down the country constantly. But there were locals who took them in for the night. I mean, complete strangers didn't speak a lick of English and then fed them you know, for free. I mean, it was just they said they were so, so, so welcoming. And so you're right. I think it is a, a pretty much a big theme for Southeast Asia, just the, the hospitality here, uh, which is fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. Um, last question, I guess. What's what's one thing that a fact <laughs> besides the dog meat that would surprise people about Vietnam? A fact about Vietnam, well, the Vietnamese alphabet, but this is more like the cultural side, so it's not yeah. something that's very evident to visitors, unless you read about it. So Vietnamese language, they, it actually like also stands partly from Chinese, from Mandarin Chinese. So we already have like native Vietnamese, the vocabulary, but then we also added Chinese to it to represent the conceptual definitions. So it's kind of like Japanese and Korean in a way. But then like when the missionaries came from like Portugal, like from other countries of Europe. They came in the 16th and 17th century, then they, they put it, they put the sounds into the Roman alphabet. So now we, o we only use ABC, we don't use Chinese, Chinese characters before, as we don't use Chinese characters anymore. But right. um, yeah, but our, the origins of a lot of words are from Mandarin Chinese, and you can see the similarities between Vietnamese, Chinese, and Japanese, and Koreans, and because of that origin. From Interesting. Mandarin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. I didn't know that. Fascinating. Huh. So, but that, so dialects when it comes to Vietnam, I mean, are the North and South very different? Is it easy to communicate with the people across the country or are the dialects quite different? The, the dialects are quite different. It's understandable. But for me, I'm from the North. But if I listen to someone from the South talk and if they speak quickly, it's, it can kind of difficult to be it can be kind of difficult to grasp what they were saying. Like the, like the dialect is kind of slurred a little bit. For example, if I say outside, outside is our traditional costume. 
um, we call it outside in the in the north really crisp really clear sound but in the south they would say oh yeah so it's kind of like soaking it's kind of like uh, interesting yeah. slang it yeah yeah interesting so yeah so still able to communicate but just it it's almost like the um it's like the united states right where we have our different regions the yeah. accents are different it'll be the same word but there's very many a lot of different ways to say it yeah so <laughs> interesting all right i got another question for you why did you pick japan for your studies okay so two reasons one is like family influence so my mom is an hr manager for a japanese company mm -hmm. and every time i was a kid i listened to her stories about like the the, the work ethics the responsibility the discipline of japanese people like really impressed i mean there's something that is known worldwide so it's not a surprise right well second is also i was fascinated by how Japanese people like manage to like combine the traditions and the like modernity in their society like, in harmony. So not all countries are able to like preserve their culture. Why like being really innovative, really creative like this? So it's really fascinating. Yeah. And living in Tokyo like always leaves me with a lot of surprises, a, a lot of discoveries. What's and, What's been your biggest surprise since you've moved there? It's, it will be the rush hour on how. Like literally, like people are crammed onto the train in six sardines, but yep. like no, no one speaks anything. Like, no one argues. Like no one fights. We just squeeze ev everyone into the trains just so they can get into the commute on time. It's and they like, literally have people pushing the people into the trains, right, to fill it up as much as they can. Occasionally, yes. Okay, okay, because I've seen not some videos. Always, of that. Not like ah. not, like every every single time, or not like very rare. But you can see it once in a while. Yeah. No way. All right. And one more. Sorry. I'm gonna. We're gonna dive into Japan real quick. Favorite food that you've. I mean, you come from Vietnam, which has amazing food. But what's been your favorite in in Japan? Everyone will say sushi or ramen is very common, but I will say okonomiyaki. Okonomiyaki is like a savory pancake. So you will have like better. You have like sliced cabbage, thin sliced pork. And mix it all together, and then like you grill it on like um, a frying, like like a frying pan almost. Okay, so, nice. Yeah, you mix the combination, and then you grill it. You lay it out flat, and then like when it's done, then you will cut it and eat it from the frying pan all together in front of you. So is that that's that's a that's a street food then? That's easy to find. Yeah, it can be a street food, or it can also be like restaurant. Okay, so that's an easy dish to find when I eventually get to japan very easy especially in osaka and in hiroshima those two cities right. ah okay good to know and i do thank you so much for sending me the notes for my japan trips coming up they're going to be postponed most likely a year but uh ha thank you so much for taking the time tonight any any last words any parting words for the world the stage is yours um definitely try to come to japan for the olympics because Japan has been pouring a lot of effort into marketing, into like the branding itself as a modern, innovative green city, and it's it's actually a milestone for Japanese society in becoming like more open, like more friendly towards foreign visitors. So, Japan has always been a really close-off country, it's still very homogeneous. So this is a chance to showcase to the world like how it is trying to catch up with the global trends. So try to visit it during that time if you can, but otherwise. It's a it's a fascinating country that will um, take you multiple visits to visit, see all of it. So yeah, 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 guys, I'm so excited. Yeah, I mean, I think that's perfect. If you if you haven't planned for the Olympics, it's not too late. We don't know the dates yet for sure, but uh, what an opportunity for all these people that thought they were going to miss it who can now potentially go. Ha, huh, thank you so much. Seriously, it's so good to see you. And um, I know we're not going to have a reunion in Tokyo, but Katie and I will definitely come visit you in Vietnam at some point. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah, guys, that's the end of the episode. Uh, tomorrow, my tomorrow, your evening in the United States, we're going to be going live in Panama, headed back to Central America. Excited oh. to see what's going on there. They're also, I'm pretty sure they're in quarantine as well. Uh, so, yeah, make sure everyone out there stay safe, stay at home, and wash your hands, and we'll <laughs> see you next time. Thanks again, Ha. Huh? We'll talk soon. Bye. Thank you. Good morning from Singapore. Guys, get the facts with Fallen, episode 9, coming to you live from 